I know a lot of us are kind of digging hard back into the pantry as we, we get ready to bake and we're bringing a bunch of um, things in. And we are very lucky today, Dr. Suter, he's with us today. He's been with the pest control industry since 1987, getting his PhD in 1994 from the University of Florida. Um, he's developing extension research and educational programs on the management of structural and household pests. Uh, this is in support of the pest control industry, homeowners, Georgia Cooperative Extension Service. Um, he coordinates training activities at the Georgia Structural Pest Control Training Center. So I don't think we could have anybody more knowledgeable to educate us today on pantry pests. Dr. Suter, I'm going to go ahead and mute myself. Thank you so much for being here today. All right, very good. Thank you, Danny. Can you can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. It sounds good. Okay. So there really is no good way to <laughs> there's no good news about bugs in your food, is there? There's <laughs> it's just you're right. We 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 get into the pantry and we start taking out those spices for to cook that pumpkin pie or doing whatever we're going to do. There's lots of surprises this time of year. Uh, in the pantry and there's there I, I was thinking about what the what a good time to do this would for maybe just before lunch would have been better so we could uh, go on to lunch looking at thinking about worms in our food and in that kind of thing but there really is no good time to talk about bugs in your in, in your food but we're going to cover uh, there's probably 40 or so different pests nationwide and worldwide that get into stored grain and uh, and in, in other processed foodstuffs. We're gonna talk about maybe uh, the top 10 or so that, that we see and, and try to try to generalize the uh, kind of the country over because we, we've got uh, numerous people from, from all over the US on, online um, this afternoon. So good morning or good afternoon, wherever you might be uh, in the US. So before, I, I want to kind of lay some groundwork before we got into talking just before we got into talking about the biology and, and the kind of just the gross nature of finding bugs in your food, I wanted to kind of set the, set the stage for uh, a process. As some of this will be a reminder to some of you. Some of you, um, if you haven't studied integrated pest management, this will be kind of a cursory overview of, of what we call integrated pest management. And uh, uh, it'll be a review, of, of course, to some of you. But, Integrated pest management comes out of California, comes out of agriculture in California back in the 1950s. And in, in a nutshell, IPM basically is a, is a decision-making process. So in California, scientists realized back in the 50s that let's look at the cropping system. Let's look at a crop as a system. And if we have key pests in that system, whether it's cotton or peanuts or vegetables, whatever you're looking at, uh, let's look at weak links in that pest. Let's look at the entire system and integrate our management techniques so that we are kind of looking at the pest from a different perspective where we just, we're not on a routine spraying schedule. We're not, uh, uh, that leads to insecticide resistance, things of that sort. But in, in its entirety, integrated pest management really is a decision making process. A lot of those tenants were adopted by the industry that I serve, the urban pest management industry. So there hasn't been as much research in the concepts of integrated pest management on the urban side, the urban pest market, as there has in agriculture. So a big reason for that is in, in agriculture, you're allowed a level of a pest population, right? So the whole, the whole idea of integrated pest management in the ag environment is that you're allowed a certain number of white flies on a cotton plant before you do something about it. Because X number of white flies on the cotton plant has nothing to do with the yield of cotton at the end of the growing season. Okay, so there is, this is the major difference between the IPM in the ag market and IPM in the urban market. So there is an allowable concentration of pests, there's an allowable number of pests in the in the ag market. It's not that way. It's not that way in, in the urban side of things, right? So uh, 
we can't get rid of most of the bed bugs out of somebody's room. We can't, there is not a, an allowable population of brown recluse spiders in somebody's home or bed bugs in a bedroom or termites in a home. So we have our, our action threshold is what we call it. An action threshold is, uh, is basically one. It's one sighting, right, of an urban pest. So I wanted to tie that to this whole concept of integrated pest management in the urban environment being a, it's a basically a decision-making process. The more you know about a system, the more, the better decisions that you make, right? So good decisions are the result of great information. And, and I was thinking about this a bit ago, and I've heard people in the past talk about uh, a medical doctor, right? So you go to the doctor, went to the doctor last week, and um, he tells you whether there's anything wrong with you. But what, what led him up to that point? Well, two weeks prior to that, you went and had a blood test. He listens to your heart, he takes your blood pressure, he has his blood work right in front of you. He has kind of inspected you, right? So he knows all about you before you walk in that office and his decisions, what he tells you is basically based on gathering information about you at that time. So uh, in the urban market, in, in, in the ag market, good decisions are always a result of, of great information. In the cornerstone of that, what I'm, what I'm really leading to here is inspections. So inspections are, they kind of give you the information that's kind of the fuel that drives this decision-making process we call IPM. So when you, when, you, when you kind of strip down all the academic discussions of IPM, it's basically decision-making, right? It's basically a decision-making process. Uh, everybody has seen a, a numerous, numerous definitions of integrated pest management. This is my favorite. And uh, it, it's by Richard Kramer. It was in a, the Malice Handbook of Pest Control back up a number of years ago. And he doesn't, even, he doesn't even refer to the term IPM. So he, Richard just simply said, uh, pest management is problem solving, right? It involves a collection of information, the inspection, analysis of that information, and then development of a strategy to solve that pest problem. And so what we're going to do is talk quite a bit about the latter part of this definition, development of, of a strategy to solve this problem. And I'll just go ahead and let the cat out of the bag now. You've got to find the pest population when it comes to, you've got to find the infested material and get rid of it, or uh, the, the problem will continue when we're talking about stored product pests, because infestations are point source. They're point source infestations. <clears throat> so if you look at uh, anybody who teaches IPM or has taken a, an IPM class, you've seen a list kind of similar to this, kind of the 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 steps maybe, or the important components of an IPM process. So inspection would be right there at the top, this information gathering. What, what do you know about the pest? If you know what the pest is and, and you've identified it properly, by the way, if you, if you don't know what it is, uh, there's, in most of the states I've seen online here, there's a Department of Entomology. Most of the entomologists, uh, many of the entomologists that you would send these to are probably online right now. So. Get a, get a sample to your county agent. That county agent, if they don't know what it is, they'll get it on to, the, to a Department of Entomology, but you have to get it identified. When you get it identified, it leads to basic information about the pest biology. And then you're, you're better equipped now, right? You've got better information to, to solve that problem. So when developing a strategy to solve that problem, you've identified what the critter is. <clears throat> when I talk to pest control operators, these are your options. You have Chemical control options, you have non-chemical control options, and I'm trying to get people to think of doing nothing. Some, in some cases, doing nothing is really the best option. If you've weighed all the options, uh, uh, economic um, and, and everything else, doing nothing sometime is your best option. Now, when you got bugs in your food, that's not an option. <laughs> uh, I think you probably need to do something to solve that problem and to keep future infestations from happening. But doing nothing is not an option in the webinar we're, get, we're talking about today. <clears throat> so I, I, I also get people to think about it's kind of a philosophical question, right? So in your day-to-day -day routine, where are you on this continuum? So are you somewhere in the middle? Are you over to the left of the middle, or are you over to the right of the middle? And the IPM basically gets you to move a little bit more right on this continuum, right? So 
there are certainly cases that really don't require a pesticide application. You can solve problems uh, completely without the use of applying any type of, of, of an insecticide. Now, two extremes. Here's an extreme where uh, sometimes there are cases where only a chemical is going to solve a problem. You, you cannot, in certain cases, um, you're going to have to do something chemically. And a, a, a really good example here is termites in a home, right? So <clears throat> uh, because of what's at stake, somebody's home, uh, you really have to do something to stop the termites from eating the structure. So in this case, uh, either a liquid insecticide application, even a spot treatment or a bait system is, is really your only option when it comes to uh, uh, termite control. On the other hand, here's another case where a pesticide did not have a chance of solving this problem. This was, this was uh, <clears throat> several years ago up in Buckhead, kind of a ritzy part of Atlanta, where uh, the, some hardwood floors were put in. And before the hardwood floors were put in, there was a layer of a <clears throat> leveling compound called gypcrete that was, was laid down underneath the hardwood floor um, so that it was a it leveled the floor, but the problem with gypcrete is you have to let it dry for two months before you put it down. There's a lot of water in it. Well, these guys poured the gypcrete in the morning, went to lunch, came back that afternoon and laid the hardwood floors, right? So what they did was they captured, they captured the water in the gypcrete. So it was a whole ecosystem of insects in this particular location. So there were staphylinid beetles eating the springtails, this was on the second floor, staphylinids eating the springtails and eating the, 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 the book lice. And there were the things that you see circled here over on the right were uh, plaster beetles. And uh, I bring this, this is a really good case of, of identification, the importance of identification. There was a pest control operator that was getting ready to fumigate this structure for powder post beetles because they thought that these little circled critters were powder post beetles. They were not, they were plaster beetles. They were eating fungus that was growing underneath the, the hardwood floor. So <clears throat> pest control operator had gone in and applied pounds of Delta dust to the floor and swept it in between the cracks, but it didn't solve the problem. So <clears throat> our recommendation was, this is happening in 10 different units, close all the windows, close all the doors, close all the sliding doors and run a dehumidifier. They had to do that for, I, I don't know when they stopped, but they were removing five gallons of water a day from these structures. Only, there was, there was no chemical solution to this problem. Only a non-chemical solution would have solved this problem. So there, there are extremes here, so just to kind of give you that. Okay, um, this may be the most important slide that I show. Uh, and it has to do with kind of the philosophy of, of, uh, of stored product pests. <clears throat> and, and this is the way you need to look at a stored product pest infestation. The adults, which generally make the phone ring or uh, bring to the attention of a keen observer that there is a problem. And when a bunch of adult insects show up, either moths that are flying uh, in, in the kitchen at nighttime uh, or a bunch of small beetles that show up on the dining room table or in the windowsill, all those, the adults are not the problem. The adults are telling you that there's something infested. The adults are the mobile stage. So in a, in a population, and you, you, so there's a lot of, there, there's some of these stored product pests that are attracted to light, some of them are not. But when they show themselves, they're basically telling you something's infested somewhere and your job is to go find it and get rid of it. So the adults are mobile. When, they, when an adult emerges from where they've been feeding, they're looking for a mate. So their sole job is to mate and, and lay eggs, and then they're, then they're gone. So that's, you have to look at the adults as just maybe a sign. It's, they're just a sign that there's a problem somewhere versus the larvae. These are all holometabolous insects, so it's egg. They got larval stages, a pupa in the, in the, in the adult, <clears throat> moths and beetles mainly. Uh, but the larvae are immobile, and they are in your cornflakes. They are in your oatmeal. So <clears throat> they're eating the processed food or, or lightly processed food uh, in somewhere in the structure. 
and I'm going to get to this in a minute, but it's not always the pantry. So you need to, you need to get away from the, from this, from thinking that it's, we call them pantry pests, but there's a lot of different things that we'll show you an exhaustive, semi-exhaustive list of what they can eat here in just a second. But the larvae are the immobile stage, and they're in an area where, um, you know, they're, they're infesting your food. That, that, that's the basic, uh, the message there. So adults are small. Some of them can be really long lived for a really small insects or attracted to lights um, and they fly. Those are the ones that disperse, right? <clears throat> so that's that you think of the adults as the that dispersal stage. Um, and because these infestations are point source, um, the problem solving is really inspection driven. It's all about inspecting and finding the source and getting rid of it. <clears throat> so you'll hear this, you'll hear this from any extension agent, you'll hear it from an entomologist that the, the, the key to solving a stored product pest problem is to find the source. Now that's easy for me to say, um, <clears throat> but it's not always easy. Um, my own personal, a couple years ago, I had a uh, Indian meal moth problem and it took me more than a year to solve it. Finally just got sick of it one day and just take everything out of the, the pantry. Um, and it turned out to be something down the hallway in a, in a, uh, in a closet, there was something infested. That bird seed or something down the in the down the hallway. So, um, <clears throat> but you got to find that source. Oops. So, when it comes to stored product pest solving stored product stored product pest issues, you're you're way over here on the right. Um, I, you know, there are probably some cases where maybe um, uh, for knockdown purposes or maybe an issue. Uh, to apply a pesticide, but I, I can't think of any re really good reasons to apply a pesticide for um, uh, for stored product pests, especially because, you know, it's a pesticide. You don't want to apply pesticides around food, period. So <clears throat> find the infested item and, and, and get rid of it. That's really the key to stored product pest infestation. <clears throat> Danny mentioned this a minute ago, but we have a really nice 16-page uh, color bulletin on uh, stored product pest uh, uh, some of the some of the key stored product pests in the in the southeast, but the the concepts are basically the same for uh, for for where you live. <clears throat> and we in this thing we cover Indian meal moth, sawtooth grain beetle, uh, red flower beetle, rice weevil, kelpie weevil, warehouse beetle, and drugstore beetle. Those are some of the some of the more common ones that we see. <clears throat> and you can download a PDF of that. <clears throat> well, what do they infest? So. Uh, you can add to this. Um, every one of you here that's listening right now probably has a, a a story about something you found them infesting that was kind of oddball. Bird seed is huge, right? So <clears throat> you 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 want to get you want to get critters in your pantry. Store the bird food inside. Uh, it won't be too long before they will move from the bird seed into the pantry. So we keep our bird seed outside. We feed our birds, but we have a, a fifty. We have a, a Garbage can outside with a top, <clears throat> keep the uh, chipmunks out of it, and we keep our bird food outside away from away from anywhere where they could get inside because in the middle of the summer, we like to just take a handful of the bird seed and look at it, and there's six or eight different stored product pests in there. We started our own colonies from our bird seed of all kinds of neat little stored product pests. Um, so it's really interesting. What, what gets in that stuff. Uh, dried anything of pro, anything that's kind of protein or of animal origin, right? So um, dog and cat food, processed foods, a cereal, your, your classic cereals and flour and crackers and pastas, things of that sort. And then things like drugstore beetles will get into uh, your dried fruits and nuts. And then there's a whole other group of critters, the, the weevils that, that like uh, uh, the legumes, the, the beans and peas and things of that sort. <clears throat> Some of the more unusual sources, um, chocolate is one of the favorite. There's, there are compounds in chocolate that are actually attractive to, to Indian meal moth. Um, if you like your chocolate, keep it in the, don't keep it in the pantry because um, <clears throat> Indian meal moths love chocolate. Um, from time to time, we, uh, we, we get samples in where they've, they've, they're in tobacco, but dried peppers, the, pe the picture you see on the right was sent to us by county agent. See the little holes in, in here? These were one of these were some of these peppers where you where you put a pot you put one one chili pepper in an entire pot of chili that's how hot they were. The drugstore beetles had no problem eating these things. 
So they, they had a really good solid infestation of drugstore beetles here. And they'll also get into spices. We have a number of uh, <clears throat> what are called domestic beetles that will chew on dead insects and light globes and things like that. And they'll move from there over to uh, uh, mounted animals. So if you have a uh, any type of feather or fur, these things love that kind of thing. Um, a couple years ago, we had a guy down in, in South Georgia. Had a he had a mounted drake and hen of every species of duck in North America, every species of waterfowl in North America. And the in the the domestic beetles had found them and were eating him out of house and home. And uh, he needed he needed some help in, in stopping them. But they also get into rat bait, active ingredient that kills rats, doesn't have any impact on the on the beetles. <clears throat> So here's a, a kind of a partial list. Every one of you could probably add something more to this, but it's your classics. Open your pantry right now. And most of you probably have uh, most of these things in, in your pantry. So it's all, the, it's all the classics, right? It's the crackers and uh, uh, powdered milk and biscuit and pasta and cornmeal and grits and you know, dry soups and bouillon and stuff like that. So th there's... Go through your pantry and there's probably a stored product pest that could eat it. So um, what the more interesting list though is, is this list here. So here's a, here's a list of things that you, would, you typically don't think of as being susceptible to stored product pests. And, and we put this list, the first one I had to put on here was the Red X. So everybody knows what Red X is, right? So Red X is one of these materials that you put in your septic tank to keep the septic tank healthy. <clears throat> um, I guess you flush it down your toilet and it goes to your septic system. But Ridex, if you look at the contents of Ridex, it has wheat germ. So what people do, of course, you, you don't use the whole box of Ridex in, in, one, in one use. So you pour a little bit down, you pour maybe 20% of the box uh, down the toilet, you flush the toilet, or you do whatever you do with Ridex. And what do you do with the, uh, with the rest of the box. You do what you do with that uh, when you open that that canister of crackers. It goes back to the back of the, you know, you take the red X and you put it underneath the, uh, uh, you know, the sink. And uh, we've had uh, at least several cases of operators who have brought us red X that had three or four different species of stored product pests uh, that had found the red X. Um, a flower arrangements, bird seed, um, bird cages, moths will get into, well, some people don't you know, they don't clean their bird cages very often. Um, Indian meal moss can, or other moth species will get into um, the bird cages. Um, any type of dry pet food, animal products, um, you know, things you give to your, your animals. If it's made of protein, it's probably susceptible to a, 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 a stored product pest. Uh, any other, so yeah, so we're going to talk about this in a little bit more detail, but decorative wall and table arrangements containing plant or animal material. So this is a, this really is important right now at this time of year. Um, some of you are going up into your attic and you're taking down ornaments that you've been storing up there since last year that were made of beans or corn or uh, anything of that sort. Um, the critters will find it in the attic and that's a good way to introduce them into your living environment. So um, so these holiday decorations that contain nuts or, as I like to say, Johnny's third grade um, art project that you he's 22 now and you can't throw it away. It has beans glued all over the piece of paper and it's in the shape of a turkey or something. And you just can't bring yourself to throw it away, so you keep it. So critters will find those beans and you'll wind up with uh, uh, you know, kelpie weevils or something else of that sort um, getting into the... Uh, the beans on on Johnny's artwork. Uh, bean bags. So we we're seeing a lot of people that the whole idea of uh, you know the cornhole toss and in the bean the, the bags truly have either beans or or corn in them. Um, those things are susceptible to getting infestations. We've seen door stops that had either beans or or corn in them that had. Uh, uh, rice weevils and, and maize weevils and that, that kind of thing uh, in them. And then bird nests and um, bird nests and rodent nests that are in attics are really great areas. So the bird or the, uh, the, bird or the 
uh, uh, the rodent will stockpile nuts. And as they leave that nest at some point in time later, a really, really good um, common critter that will get in there is Indian meal moths. And you'll wind up getting Indian meal moths in the attic. It might come down from the attic through the, through the fireplace. So I was talking to Mike Merchant about this just the other day. I've had numerous, uh, not a couple cases over the past couple of years where we've had unexplained Indian meal moth infestations in a, in a spotless home. And, but they, we were catching Indian meal moths in the attic and we never did find out the, the, the point source of where they were coming from. But you go around the outside and you can see areas where maybe squirrels that were getting into the attic soffits or, or the rodents that had stockpiled stuff up there. Um, the nesting material itself can become susceptible to uh, stored product pests and domestic beetles and, and things of that sort. The common place though, if, for a pantry pest kind of is the pantry, right? So <clears throat> this is my pantry at home. So when we open something, we try to put it into a sealed container. So, <clears throat> you know, you see the raisins up here in the grits and the, the crackers and everything else. Um, try to use those as quickly as you can. It's inevitable though, uh, with a deep pantry that some of these things, as you buy things that are on sale and you put them up front, these things get pushed to the back. And through time, we're just like everybody else. Something will find that. And there will be an open bag of potato chips or, or some pasta or something that's way in the back of the pantry that critters are going to find and they will move from that to other items in the pantry. And that can be a very difficult thing to get rid of the, to get rid of the problem. So um, we, Again, there, there are things and there are more things in the pantry that a, a stored product pest can probably eat than not, right? So something can eat mostly anything in this pantry. So I'm not gonna go through gory details of this bug can eat this, but not this. I'm not gonna go through those kind of details. Just assume that if it's open and it's in your pantry, there's a good chance something can find it and eat it. It may take a little bit of time. That's why a lot of these problems start in the back of the pantry, right? <clears throat> and I've, I've kind of kind of talked about this already, but I uh, kind of highlighted this, but inspect areas other than the pantry. So here's one of those, um, the big holes that you see here in these beans, those are exit holes from a cowpea weevil. And this was a decorative, somebody uh, years, a couple years ago, the county agent sent me decorative ornaments, these are Christmas ornaments that somebody made, probably a styrofoam ball where they glued beans onto styrofoam balls and used them as Christmas ornaments. Beautiful ornament, but uh, cowpea weevils found them. And uh, when you go store them in the attic, something's gonna find them and, and eat those things. And we've talked about some of these, some of these other things. So the attic is important, right? So to start in your pantry, that's most likely where an infestation will be, but um, inspect other areas. So. The, the common things in attics might be bird and rodent nests. So Indian meal moths and, and, and other beetles might start there, but once they start, remember when you see that adult, that adult is looking for a different food source now. So it might start in the attic, but when you see moths flying around at nighttime, they're A, looking for a mate, and B, they're looking for something to infest, and they have, they, they have really good attraction to the smell of foods. In fact, some of the We'll talk about this at the end here, but some of the the attractants in some of the traps that are used to monitor um, uh, a lot of these uh, stored product pests are food based. So they've identified compounds that are that are food based, and there are other compounds that are um, uh, aggregation pheromones. But your Christmas decoration, especially this time of year, <clears throat> if it's made of popcorn or or beans. And as we mentioned, uh, your child's third grade art project that you didn't have the heart to throw away, uh, something's going to find that and eat, uh, <clears throat> start eating the, the corn or the, uh, or the beans um, that were glued to that piece of paper in 1978. <clears throat> Look away from the pantry in terms of, um, you know, food closets or, or not food closets, but closet closet where you store all your junk, right? So. Uh, these were uh, corn cobs that were, be, that were used to feed birds and squirrels on the outside. But what do you do with something like this? So you, you, you might buy a, a, a bag of these um, uh, corn cobs 
and before you know it this gets pushed back behind these paper bags all the clutter that's in here is great places for any meal moths to to wander away as larvae and to uh, to pupate and now you've got a source of moths that leave this closet and start looking for other sources of food and voila you've got them in your pantry so so when, when you find that again when you find that when you find those critters out on the uh, out on the the counter or on the floor or flying around in the evening time or in the windowsill think pantry but also think away from away from the pantry and, and think of the diversity of things that they can eat it's not just it's not just pasta and cereal there's a lot of different things these stored product pests uh, can make a living on and that's why they're pests right uh, this was my own case and this was in Indiana <clears throat> we had uh, put a, a bunch of, of uh, bird food out in a closet um, in the on the this is in an apartment uh, in a closet storage closet outside on the balcony and for some reason when they built this apartment complex there was a there was an intake from inside this uh, storage closet straight into the kitchen <laughs> so we were getting Indian for some reason we we're getting unexplained eel mo meal moths on the in the walls at nighttime and I finally went out here and this thing was just crawling with uh, Indian meal moths so of course I ran in for my camera that's my foot right there um, and and took pictures of this thing and and uh, and got some really good started I think started a collection from this from this population as well a uh, clutter like this think of think of all the things that could be in those boxes right so <clears throat> uh, seeds from an ornament from years and years ago uh, anything made of wool that uh, could be found by a clothes moth or any type of uh, cat treat or a dog treat uh, that you you know you box this stuff up years ago you've got it piled up in your garage and you have no idea what's in those boxes you haven't been in those boxes in five ten years so there's all kinds of things that can that can uh, be fed on by stored product pests it might start here and then you open the door and goes right into your kitchen typically from the from the carport right and then next thing you know you've got uh, uh, stored product pest problems in your kitchen <clears throat> if you if you feed birds you're in an area where you can feed birds don't ever I think I said this earlier but don't ever keep the bird food inside um, I, I don't think that the uh, uh, I don't think that that's monitored very well. Um, so the, there's there is a level of probably uh, insect infestation that's allowed in bird feed because quickly after the soon after you buy it, you could go through it and find Indian meal moths and in beetles and all kinds of other critters in in the in the cracked cracked corn in the uh, the sunflower you know the cracked sunflowers and everything else. They're fantastic. If you ever want to start a stored product pest colony. Go buy yourself a 10 pound bag of bird food and just kind of hang on to it and uh, you'll have all the different species that you might want to so don't ever store this especially in the inside right next to the pantry so um, <clears throat> you want to store this outside want to store your bird food outside just make sure it's secure it's got a got a lid on it in my neighborhood it's either chipmunks we one evening went outside there was a raccoon trying to get inside the uh, the garbage can because he could smell the food in there so let's go through um, let's go through a little bit in a little bit of time I have left. What time? How much time is it? It's thirty-five till, um, twenty-five till. So let me just kind of go through um, in the few minutes I got left. We'll, we'll kind of talk about some of the key stored product pests. So I, I'm thinking that probably Indian meal moth nationwide is probably number one. Um, Everybody, I think, knows what an Indian meal moth looks like. They're actually a very beautiful moth, small moth, maybe a half an inch long. Um, they've got that copper colored uh, towards their their back end and more of a tan color towards their front um, they engage in this really unique behavior called wandering so so the larvae you're seeing here down on the right as they in in many many fly and moth species will do this they actually crawl away from their food source so if they're in the back of the cabinet in your cornflakes 
as they develop, they will crawl away from there, and you'll find these larvae on the ceiling. And what they're doing is they're looking for a place to safely pupate. And so you'll see these, um, you'll see these things crawling on your ceiling, uh, coming from your pantry, and they'll go. Oftentimes, they'll go to that little crease between the ceiling and the wall, and that's where they'll pupate. And then that evening, um, they'll start. The, the adults will start emerging after a period of time after pupation, and they're a looking for males, or they're a looking for mates, and then they're looking for food. And that means if they're successfully mating, it's common to find mating pairs. Uh, they'll go back into your back, back into your food closet. So it's real key to to find these things. <clears throat> Trapping is a really good way of detecting the presence of moths, but you need to keep in mind that the, the most effective traps have what are called sex pheromones. So a sex pheromone is a pheromone that's released by a female moth when she becomes um, ready to mate. She'll release a, a, a pheromone that is highly, highly attractive to males. Keep in mind though, when you put out a sticky trap, uh, all you catch are males. And a male, males of many insects, only have, the females only have to mate one time to produce all the eggs that they'll ever make in their life. So you can't stop that process. You can kill all the males you want. You could probably kill 98% of the males in a population, but that 2% is going to mate the rest of the female population. So it looks really impressive to put out a sex pheromone trap for Indian male moths. I've got a picture of this a little bit later. You might catch 30 moths, but they're all males. And so all, of real, all traps really do is, is tell you Two months from now, am I catching fewer moths than I was two months prior? That tells you relatively maybe what you've done is working. It might tell you if you've got three or four traps out throughout the house and you're catching most of the moths in a trap that's next to the closet down the hallway, it could tell you maybe your problem is close to that area. But they should never, you should never look at traps as a means of eliminating a a, a pest infestation. You, you truly, you need to go back to what we talked about earlier. You've got to find that source. And here's a good, good picture of an Indian meal moth. So here's, it's kind of gross what they do. So this is, um, <clears throat> this is oatmeal. And you can see the, the larvae over here crawling out of the oatmeal. All these larvae are getting ready to, to, to pupate. There's even had a few uh, sawtooth grain beetles in there, but they produce this silk. Uh, the larvae produce this silk. So when you've got an Indian male moth infestation in your Kellogg's, you'll pour the Kellogg's out and all the flakes are stuck together in like a sheet. And so you can hold the sheet of, of, of uh, corn flakes up. Um, that's a good sign that you probably need to throw those corn flakes away. So um, <clears throat> that this, this silk that they spend is uh, really, uh, really abundant when the, when the Indian, Indian male moths are present. And there's what the larvae look like, right? So they're probably, our larvae are probably three quarters of, a, of an inch long. Um, I'm, I'm thinking maybe number two or even number three would be uh, drugstore beetles. We, are, we commonly see drugstore beetles in the, in the southeast. These critters, uh, here's another important component here. These things will fly to lights. So uh, you might find them in windowsills. Very common to find them in windowsills <clears throat> or around lights that you have on. Um, they really like kind of uh, dried flowers and, and peppers and, and things of that sort. And they have this really distinctive three-segmented clubbed antenna. They're probably an uh, eighth of an inch long, um, but they have a very distinct three-segmented club right there. So just keep in mind, when you if you find drugstore beetles, they're really good flyers and they're attracted to light. So they could be coming from anywhere in the structure. <clears throat> and uh, we, I showed this picture earlier, what they, what they do to these... Uh, uh, dried peppers and anything again anything of 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 uh, animal origin so here's a dog treat all the holes that you see there uh, were by drugstore beetles in fact i have a colony of drugstore beetles and we keep them we give them some uh, milk bone dog chews every once in a while and they very keeps them happy and they uh they love these things <clears throat> if that's not number two or three, this would be number two or three. So sawtooth grain beetle, tiny, tiny little beetle, long-lived beetle for its size, right? So they're very small and flat. <clears throat> um, they harbor in, in crevices. They don't need very much food to sustain themselves. And for a tiny, tiny insect, 
they can live months and months. So this is a real small insect. Uh, we've witnessed them at our, uh, where you would put, get a Tupperware container, put some oatmeal in a Tupperware container, put the top of it on, and uh, you know, days or months later, you'll see sawtooth grain beetles around the edge of the Tupperware. So when you take the top off, they fall into the, they fall into the oatmeal. So what you're looking at here is these are grains of oatmeal, right? So you can see some of the beetles here, but there's nine beetles in that picture right there. And I, and I found a couple more. There's nine, there's 10, 11. You could probably find a, a few more here if, if you wanted to. So uh, this is something you don't want to see floating um, <clears throat> in your oatmeal on a you know cold morning. Um, so you want to keep sawtooth grain beetles out of your food, right? Uh, another common one would be the rice or maize weevil, very common in a uh, whole corn. Um, so you see, uh, <clears throat> if you take, it's a classic weevil, it has that snout as a weevil, and you take the, they've got these four kind of lightened spots uh, underneath their elytra. That's very common for this, um, very common identifying character, either, characteristic for uh, rice weevils. And they feed on grains like corn or rice, and uh, <clears throat> we've uh, fed them on split peas before but they generally require whole kernels for, uh, for the larvae to develop. We don't see flower beetles very often here in Georgia, but they're pretty common in parts of the, um, parts of the U.S. Uh, think of processed foods. Flour is very common. We have a colony. We keep them on flour. We give them a, a pound of flour, and they just uh, they do really well on, on flour. They have this kind of elongated antenna. It's not a really good picture of the antenna, but the the antennae, the, the segments get larger as you go uh, distally. So as you go away from the insect, the segments get larger. So they have this kind of this club um, uh, size antenna. They're probably three sixteenths of seven inch long. And down here where we are, the red flower beetles, probably the most, uh, most common. Uh, warehouse beetles have shown up more and more over the years. Um, it's a dermestid beetle. You see the larvae here, very characteristic of the larvae. They have these cinnamon colored seedy on their back end. Over here is their, that's their head, that's where their chewing mouth parts are. And then I've got a better picture here um, next. But uh, the adults, the thing about uh, warehouse beetles is the adults look like a varied carpet beetle. Um, <clears throat> so I've got a picture of that here in just a second. But you see all the cast skins in here. Um, of, this was in uh, noodles. So this is a warehouse beetle. These are the larvae of warehouse beetles. You can see these cinnamon colored uh, very characteristic of a dermestid beetle are these uh, numerous seedy or hairs on the end. And those can be, um, um, for some people, when you have large, large populations of any type of dermestid, those can, uh, uh, those can become irritating to people if they breathe them in. Never known of a case of that, but uh, um, I've read where they, they can be irritating. So with the warehouse beetle, we have the, the head up here. This is the tail end, and you have these uh, 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 cinnamon colored. Uh, CD. Here's the adult. So that adult, that adult kind of looks like a varied carpet beetle. And let me show you here. There's a carpet beetle right there on the right, and the adult warehouse beetle is there on the left. So they're about the same size. Warehouse beetle is a little bit bigger. Uh, these are the larvae side by side. So the varied carpet beetle larva is on the right, and the warehouse beetle larva is on the is on the left. And they, they eat different. Uh, they overlap a little bit, but um, typically you find them in different uh, di on different foods. Um, <clears throat> cowpea weevils are um, are also pretty common. They, they typically think of legumes, right? So anything that's a bean. So the hole, that big hole that you see right here in the center, that's an exit hole. The white things are eggs. So uh, black-eyed peas, any type of bean, these things will get in. They consume the entire contents of the bean, and, and then they merge. Really strong flying critter and running, so they run real well, and they fly real well. So when we have a colony of these, we have to be careful when we take the top off the container that they all don't fly away. They're really good flyers, and uh, uh, they run real well too. So they're, they're, they kind of look, have kind of a, a mean look to them, but they are a weevil, but they have this enlarged um, femur, and you've got a, a, a spike right here, a spine right here, that is very, or a spine, I think it's up here, is very characteristic of a cowpea weevil on their uh, on their femur, <clears throat> and we talked about that. Hide beetles also is another dermestid beetle. 
I was trying to get more into fabric pests here, but we don't see that. We see this from time to time. I've seen it a few times um, on uh, on um, eating leather from an African drum. Um, I've run into them a couple times in the egg dehydrating plants. Georgia is a major poultry uh, producing uh, state, and I've been into a couple of egg dehydrating plants where they make egg powder. They'll bring in uh, poultry eggs by the 50 gallon drum and they dry that down and the dried egg powder cakes in the plant and it's a protein source. So these beetles have gotten into uh, <clears throat> uh, and are eating on the uh, dehydrated egg. So uh, probably wouldn't be in your pantry but could be eating other things that a typical dermestid would eat. And that's what the adult looks like. They're probably a, a three, uh, maybe three sixteenths of an inch long, maybe a quarter of an inch, something like that. They're, the, the back of the adult is just a black looking beetle with this three segmented club, but the underneath is a silvery white CD. So you can't, it's very characteristic of a, uh, of a, of a hide beetle. Um, I've about run out of time here. Let me just take a second. I, I, we've already talked about this, locating the source and, and the various things that really you should look at. I, we, we talked about all of this. Um, if it's a valuable thing, it's a 50 pound bag of $30 dog food, you, you might want to um, freeze it, right? So um, freeze it for uh, a period of time, maybe at least a week to be safe. Um, <clears throat> or, you know, for most of this stuff, if it's in your food, I hope you'll throw it away. So, uh, um, and then you want to keep, uh, uh, look at things like bird seed and um, uh, keep those away from, from where you your pantry might be. Clean up spilled material. That's a, that's a biggie. So if you if you empty your pantry, if you found out where the critter is and you throw that bag of empty cereal away or that bag of open cereal away, clean up. I mean, um, everybody's pantry has spilled food in it. And if you have a crack back in there that you can't remove the drawers, I have used a pressurized air canister, something like you use to clean your, your keyboard. You can stick that nozzle down in there and blow um, you can blow out food and even some larvae and small insects. So think of a, think of these, some of these tiny, tiny beetles can get down in those cracks. They don't need a lot of food to survive. So you need to get them out of there. So to make, to make sure that's clean and then wipe that down with pine saw or something like that. <clears throat> and then we talked about this store, store things that are susceptible in, in containers, right? So that's just, uh, and use kind of first in first out type thing. <clears throat> And let me just finish here with this, the, the pheromones. We talked about this, but the, the most common um, traps are, the and the best traps have sex pheromones in them, but we also have food attractants and, and aggregation pheromones. Here's a picture of Indian meal moths. These are all male moths, right? So that little septum right there has an Indian meal moth sex pheromone in it. <clears throat> highly, highly attractive uh, uh, to, to moths and uh, to male moths only, but it only takes a couple moths to probably mate that entire population of females. So this is this looks impressive, but it's not really impressive. All it does is tell you that they're there, the moths are there. And this is a closed moth trap. Again, these are all um, uh, these are all male closed moths, case making closed moths um, from one of these uh, bullet lures that were put out that had sex pheromone in it. So uh, we talked about this too. The uh, the traps will detect the presence of adults males um, using the sex pheromones, um, but they're not going to reduce the population. It'll help define um, the areas where the infestation might be and it can help assess the effectiveness of a control program. So if somebody comes in and does something, you can continue to put out these traps. Usually these lures will last a month or so or, or even more before you have to replace them. So in summary, um, just keep in mind that most pests are, they're very secretive. They feed in hidden areas. They do really well in dark, hidden places, like that box of crackers that's been pushed to the back of the of the pantry. Um, when the pest numbers build up to the point that the adults become visible to you, then you have a problem. And the adults are telling you, the adults are telling you there's a problem, and it's now it's your job to go find what they're infesting and get rid of it before it spreads. Um, <clears throat> and then finding. Um, I, I think you get the point here. Finding the source of that infestation is really the key to lasting control. So there's, there, there's not 
a whole lot of reasons why pesticides should be applied for the control of stored product pests. If you look at it from the perspective of the adult is telling on themselves that there's we're, we're feeding somewhere, you need to go. Now your challenge is to try to go find out what we're feeding on and where we're feeding. And it could be anywhere in the structure. So I'm going to go ahead and leave it at that. And uh, I'll turn it over, I guess, to Tim or, or um, just see if you have any, any questions have come in, Tim. Thanks for everybody's attention. Thank you very much. That was awesome. Anyone have any questions they want to, they would like to ask? Danny, I have this presentation. If everybody wants it, I, I can, uh, I'll send it to them or I'll send it to you and you can distribute as you see fit. Any county agents anywhere in the U.S. that, that want the presentation, I'd be happy to give it to them. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you. Anybody, while we're, while we're waiting for um, to see if a question comes in, I'm going to throw up some poll questions right quick. If y'all wouldn't mind filling those or checking a box for us. I don't know if you can see the, um, the chat or the questions and answers, but a lot of people are saying thank you so much. And this was a great presentation. We do have one that says, are any of these pests harmful if they are digested? So I'll just tell you up front, I don't know. Um, I do know that flower beetles, there are some compounds that come from uh, flower beetles that make food distasteful. And I, I want to say I read or heard somewhere that uh, consumption of too many flower beetle, there's compounds in some of these insects that can be harmful. Um, and I, I think, as, as I mentioned, the CD, the hairs on some of these dermestid beetles, you saw how hairy, it's kind of a characteristic of all the dermestids is that they are really hairy. And the larvae are really hairy. And when you have huge populations, some of those hairs can become airborne. And there's a, there's a term for it, I can't remember. Tim, help me. Um, there's a term for it, but <clears throat> uh, if you breathe those hairs, um, you know, they can be, uh, they can get in your lungs. So well, there, there is a question that a couple of people have asked, um, would love to watch this again. Will it be available? Yes, every Monday after the webinars on Friday, these are recorded and the recorded version is placed back on the, the same page. And here's a question about tapeworms in flower beetles. I'm not sure what the question is. I've, it's tapeworms in flower beetles, question mark. Yeah, I, do, I don't know. I'm going to have to, I, I don't know about that. We, we may have some people online who could comment on that. There are a number of insects that serve as intermediate hosts for tapeworms. Uh, fleas are known for that, and, but I don't know about any of these flower pests, if, if that's true or not. We have any other parasitologists on the line? Danny, my email address is dsuter at uga.edu if anybody wants this presentation. Just, uh, just email me and I'll, I can send it to you. Uh oh, let's see. Uh, someone said they're definitely going to start looking at their food more closely and I'm typed in the chat box earlier, but every time I, every Friday after these webinars, I get the urge to go <laughs> home and clean. It's disgusting. You know, there's nothing worse than pouring milk on your cereal and having something float to the top. <clears throat> it's kind of, you lose your appetite. Well, y'all, if there are no more questions, First of all, thank you. That was a great webinar and it was practical information that we can all use. Um, all you guys that, that are on here that have asked, we will be back next year for 2019. Apologies that it's not up and ready yet, but the topics are going to be, they're going to be good ones. So oh, we might have had one more just came in. 
could you please give your email a, a email address out again or maybe if you could type it in the chat box there it is so somebody have it you just asked the question and I think Vicki just put it in the chat box for you oh good yeah D S U I T E R at UGA .edu. Okay, anybody else? Well, if that's all, um, check back soon because the link for 2019 will be up soon. Dr. Suter, thank you. Um, Vicki, Vicki and Dr. Davis, thank you. And everybody stay warm. We'll see you in February. <clears throat> Y'all have a great Christmas. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. How you doing, Tim? I'm doing well down here, I'm trying to get past our uh, end of the year stuff. Are you in Savannah? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, end of the year. Uh, nuts. This thing says it's still recording. Yeah. All right, we'll talk to you all later. Bye. Bye.